What's cracking for the second time? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. This is the first in season bunk bed breakdown show of the year. Football starts tomorrow night. It's, it doesn't necessarily feel like it because we didn't get preseason games. So we're missing a lot of the hype that comes with that. But it is here, alas. And every point that gets put up on the board starting tomorrow night will count towards your fantasy football team. This is a video that we make each and every season. Uh, right before the season kicks off, we want to get ahead of the game. So we look at like the first month of the season <clears throat> and we talk about some potential buy low, sell high candidates that we think will kind of disperse themselves as the first few games of the season play themselves out. So if you have them on your team, Maybe you'll be looking to, you know, start them for the first couple of weeks and then up, uh, offload them or vice versa. You know, if you need an RB2, we have a couple of guys here that we think might start slow out of the gate, et cetera, et cetera. As the season goes on, this is going to be redraft focused. But for bunk beds going forward, what we're going to do is we're probably uh, going to have a weekly show that's mixed with dynasty stuff where we're talking about some uh, similar to what Mike does in terms of like market watch, look at guys that we think their stocks are kind of trending up or down when it comes to dynasty league. So maybe a little bit of a, a deeper dive into those types of players, because you don't see a lot of waiver wire, great pickups in dynasty uh, throughout the season because everyone rosters 28 guys or whatever. So we're going to have a show where we kind of just talk about everything that we uh, saw from the previous weekend. So it's going to be like 45 minutes of us just kind of talking, chopping up about fantasy, and then we'll get into some deeper dynasty targets throughout. So that'll, that'll pretty much be the content that we have for bunk bed breakdowns throughout the year. And of course, Mike and Noah will be putting out their own, content throughout the year on the bunk beds youtube channel so make sure you are following both the youtube channel and the podcast because they got a lot of stuff that is dynasty specific that won't be on this youtube channel trade targets weeks one through four somebody get me off this fucking mic talk mike i dare you to talk i'm waiting for you to hit the intro fuck that was quick, <laughs> that, was quick. that backfired on me <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, we got we got some trade targets this week. Um, you know, I think before we get into the targets, so I just want to stress the reason why you focus early on in redraft, at least for the early weeks, is because you don't want dead weight on your rosters. Because if you are in a traditional fifteen man league, you know, uh, those roster spots are so valuable, especially <laughs> early on in the season. That fucked me up a little bit too, Noah. When you said <laughs> I thought he meant like a fifteen team league. Yeah, like, <laughs> that ain't traditional at all. But I'm gonna let you roll with it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, for the rosters, right? Like, is you know, in Dynasty, like, especially if you're playing Dynasty, like me, and you're coming over to redraft, like, everyone looks, like, sweet. You're like, oh, man, I want to, like, stash this guy because he might, mm -hmm. like, pop it off. I want to stash, like, James Robinson because I think he's that dude. Uh, but, like, you know, you, you have to, like, fill a starting lineup, and especially when the bye weeks are hitting and all that stuff, like, those roster slots are super valuable. So you want guys, like, my general approach is I want to target people that – I think will increase in value in the first like one to four weeks. And that's usually how I play redraft, you know, exceptions obviously are made for pure studs, you know, guys like Barkley and stuff, but for the most part in the middle tier guys, you don't want to like roster guys early on that what you don't think going to increase in value because the, you, if you don't feel comfortable starting them, you can't trade them. Like it's basically like a dead spot on your roster. So that's why we kind of focus on early season, but to kick it off, we're going to kick it off with snacky boys, Favorite player, probably favorite person in the entire fucking world, and that's DJ Danny Dimes. And he's currently going at 140 overall as the QB 15. And if you are in a traditional single QB league, I would, I would not advise you draft Daniel Jones because he has a absolutely brutal, brutal opening schedule against Pittsburgh, Chicago, and San Francisco. And if you guys have seen... Any highlights of Daniel Daniel Jones, you know that that guy has zero pocket awareness and fumbles like no tomorrow. So against some of the best pass rushing D lines in the NFL, you do not want to put him in your starting roster week one, week two, or really week three for that matter. But what that does create is a buy low opportunity after week three, because after week three, his schedule really opens up. Um, I think he probably plays... He goes up against the Rams, which, again, is not, is not great. But then you get Dallas, 
Washington, Eagles, Bucks, Washington again. So that middle stretch is really where you're going to make our make our bread with Daniel Jones with the rushing upside there. So I think he's someone that uh, you should be looking to target after those early weeks are over. Yeah, in those first four matchups, you look at those teams in terms of how many turn- turnovers they forced last season. Pittsburgh was number one. Chicago, they weren't that great, but they have a few guys returning from injury. San Francisco was the sixth most turnovers forced, and the Rams were ninth most. And if there's one thing Daniel Jones loves to do other than dress up as a substitute teacher, it's turn the ball over. (laughs) He had 12 interceptions, 18 fumbles last season. And a huge part of this also is week one, they're playing Monday night against the Pittsburgh Steelers. You don't think the whole world is going to be watching him throw four picks and fumble the ball twice. The same thing happened last year. I'm pretty sure the Bears were on Thursday night football to open the season. Mitchell Trubisky looked like an absolute asshole, which is kind of normal for him. And because of that, I was telling people to sell Allen Robinson. That obviously didn't work out. (laughs) But the theory still holds that when you watch a terrible quarterback in real life play, you don't have much confidence in him. And if week one he comes out, he puts up a dud. Week two against Chicago puts up a dud. San Francisco has a very good defense, and the Rams are, I guess, mediocre. But if that's four weeks where only one of them he puts up a serviceable game, in one QB leagues, people are going to be dropping him. In two quarterback or super flex leagues, people aren't going to be feeling comfortable about an extremely boom-bust type of QB2 on their roster, maybe even a QB1 because he is being drafted fairly high at the price that he's going in this offseason. So uh, I think he also pre- presents a very good buy-low opportunity because he's going to start off the season extremely terribly. The fact that he plays in the NFC East means he gets like four to six games a season where he has basically a cakewalk. And on top of what Mike said, later on in the season, they play Cincinnati, Seattle, Arizona, Cleveland. So those, those seem to be games where they're going to have to score They don't have a great defense. They have decent weapons. So there's going to be garbage time. He has legs to run, as we saw in his rookie year. So we know, like, we know what he is. We know he's not a great real life quarterback, but the opportunity that presents itself in New York is that he gets to throw a lot and he gets to run a lot. So he's going to give you fantasy points. So if you can capitalize after the first four weeks of the season, you're probably going to get yourself a very solid QB2 for the rest of the year. Snacks is going to be fucking sweating bullets before that Pittsburgh game comes on, man. He knows he's about to get embarrassed in front of the entire world. It's going to be fantastic. But, yeah, DJ, like, uh, the promise that came from DJ last year was obviously from the ground, but the big games he had were against these really, really weak opponents last year, right? Like, his four big games were all against, like, Tampa Bay, Detroit, New York Jets, like, teams like that. So we're still kind of sitting here on the cusp of whether or not we really buy into DJ as a real-life, you know, quarterback. Um, so he was pretty much undraftable in one quarterback leagues. He's one of those guys that you drafted him without actually looking at the schedule. And then you're sitting there in week one and you're like, fuck, I already have to drop him. So yeah. he's someone that if you haven't super flex, obviously you're holding on to, hopefully you grab the third quarterback, like a, you know, like a Derek Carr or Teddy Bridgewater who play each other in week one. And you can kind of weather the storm for the first couple of weeks, but he's going to be uh, a guy that will struggle early on, have a lot of turnovers. People will be like, fuck Daniel Jones sucks. And then he'll get some good matchups and then we'll be like, okay, he's good for fantasy again. I do want to talk more about like overall strategy. Cause Mike, you got into it. And I think when we're looking at redraft leagues, this is, I remember Noah, the first video we made last year, like Aaron Jones was the first guy we talked about, right? Cause we hyped him up all summer. We're like, he's going to, you know, he's going to go nuclear this year. And we put him in the first trade targets video. We're like, he's going to struggle out of the gate. He has a really, really tough slate straight out of the gate. That Thursday night football game happened where he put up an absolute dud against Chicago. And I remember making a video the next morning because everybody was like, oh, my fucking God, you told me to draft Aaron Jones. I'm (laughs) like, yo, like we also knew he was going against Khalil Mack and the Chicago Bears defense. Like, don't fret about it. When we're drafting a player for 16 games, we're drafting them for 16 games. Okay, so when we're putting our chips on a certain player, like the reason I don't like guys like, uh, Todd Gurley's and David Johnson's I'm well aware that they're going to come out of the gate and probably get 18 to 22 touches for the first three or four weeks where I'm putting my chips on the table is that with that workload they're going to be inefficient because they haven't been efficient running backs for a while and when that happens usually the coaches tend to start making moves where they get other players involved and that starts taking away from their workload or we've seen a lot of these older running backs start to deteriorate when they get higher volume over the last couple of years David Johnson a perfect example of that so yes these guys are set up in prime position to get workhorse touches out of the gate I'm putting my bet on the side of that not holding up over the course of the season so when Le'Veon Bell gets 22 touches in week one don't fucking come at us saying that we told you not to draft him because he wasn't going to get work. Like, we are well aware that that's going to happen. We're looking more long-term strategy when we're talking about fading these guys. So systematically, you just have to know from the, from the rip, these veterans are going to get more playing time than the younger guys and the rookies right away. But that needs to be, like, 
into your plan, into your system when you're talking about trading for guys like that. We see it year in, year out with the rookies. They get a lot less play time, but we know they're going to get adjusted to it because coaches are, are very stubborn when it comes to that thing. Yeah, I mean, and just on that point, like, you know, sometimes I get people that send me rosters like, hey, like, you told me you like Aker, Swift, Dobbins, you love the rookies. Check out this, like, check out this draft that I did. And it's like literally their four running backs are mm -hmm. like Aker, Swift, Dobbins, and like Zach Moss. And like, guys, you know, we told you many times like you can't go all in on the rookie running backs because, you know, unless you're like one of those elite guys that got drafted, like top 10 draft capital, like Ezekiel Elliott, like Leonard Fournette, you are not guaranteed touches out the gate. You got to like kind of, kind of earn, earn the place on the team. So guys like Jonathan Taylor, guys like DeAndre Swift, um, I think Akers actually might get a decent amount of touches out of the gate, but the most so. like Dobbins as well. Like these guys are not going to come out and you're going to put them in your RB2 and feel good about it. Like I, I, and I love all these players and I do not feel comfortable putting them in. Like, like, like Todd Gurley, I want no part of him, but he'll probably be a borderline RB1 for me. Like my week one rankings, he's going yeah. against the, C the Seattle Seahawks. Like he's probably going to get 20 touches. There's nothing else I could do about that, but I'm putting the bet on the fact that, like, after a month of the season, he's going to start deteriorating to that, like, low RB2, high RB3 threshold for you. Yeah, and the thing is, like, you don't – the reason why we tell you not to draft someone like a Todd Gurley or like a Melvin Gordon is because you would have had to burn a third-round, fourth-round pick on him. Right. And then you have a ticking time bomb in your hand. Then you're just, like, you're sweating buckets because, like, if you don't sell him after, what is it, week three, maybe week four – maybe week five, you know, like that time is coming where he's going to take that dip. So that's why we tell you not to draft those guys. Um, but like, it's a little bit different from someone like Daniel Jones. Cause like, you're not spending like a top five round capital on him. And that, that's some of these guys will cover down here as well. But, but yeah, right. that's, a, that's a good point. And you know, something to consider for sure. All right. Well, well speaking of those veteran running backs, uh, someone that we have been fading for the last couple of years and it is, it is not worked out well, but I think this is, this is the fucking year and it, it's Mark Ingram of the Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> this is like the perfect fit for exactly what we're talking about where Mark Ingram is going to come into the year as a starter. He's going to come into the year as the veteran, but we know this kid JK Dobbins is kind of creeping on the, on the heels of Mark Ingram and Mark Ingram's probably going to uh, do really, really, really well over the first month of the season. When you look at the schedule, Cleveland week one, Houston week two, Kansas City week three, Washington week four, Cincinnati week five. Those are all like bottom eight run defenses per both PFF and football outsiders last year. Soon as week six hits, it's Philly, it's Pittsburgh, it's by Indianapolis, Patriots, Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Dallas, like all plus run defenses on the flip side of things. So I'm thinking like after week four, you get – a bunch of really good games at a marking room where their game script is going to be great. They're going to have a lot of scoring opportunities, a lot of touchdown opportunities. J.K. Dobbins, by that time, week four or five, is going to start creeping into that role that we want to see over the second half of the year. So you have a few things working against him. I think it's the Dobbins. I think it's the schedule. And I think it makes sense that Ingram at that point is going to get that reputation where he's like, nope, well, he's just Mark Ingram again. Everybody who faded him was wrong. And I think over the second half of the year, we'll see his workload come down. Dobbins will eat into that. We'll see the schedule get a little bit harder. So the playmaker who actually makes plays on his own, Dobbins, who gets the ball in space, who catches the passes, is going to be the more valuable back in that backfield. So Ingram seems like a really, really good sell high just based on schedule, uh, personnel usage. And uh, I also think like the Ravens offensive line took a little bit of a hit this off season. They lost some pieces and I don't think they're going to be able to, yeah, I don't think they're going to be able to run as successfully as they did last year. Obviously their efficiency was, was craziness and they probably should just naturally come down a bit, but I just don't think they're going to be as dominant as they were. Now that teams have a year of, you know, film on Lamar and film on what exactly they want to do. So I, I don't know if this offense sets up to be like the perfect lightning in a bottle. It was for Ingram last year. Yeah, and with the investment that they made in J.K. Dobbins, I don't see any sort of way that Mark Ingram sees an uptick in volume. And as, as you were saying, with the efficiency being as high as it was and him scoring like five receiving touchdowns on 20 targets or some bullshit like that, I don't see any, any way he, uh, he crawls into like the top 12 as he did last year. On top of the schedule, as you mentioned, really works out in J.K. Dobbins' favor because if he starts out hot and then he starts to slow down a little bit, they might want to see what they have in J.K. Dobbins. And I guess like J.K. Dobbins, as we talked about basically this entire offseason, as you brought up earlier, Nick, like you draft these guys at their price knowing that it's a full 16-game slate. And if Mark Ingram starts off the year at 12 to 13 carries and then he starts to slow down and J.K. Dobbins works his way up because they did spend a second-round second round draft capital on him, and Mark Ingram's value where he's going right now isn't going to hold up throughout the entire season. And on top of that, like what is he, 30 years old right now? How many times have we seen running backs hit the age of 30 coming off of a very good year and just fall apart, whether it's like DeMarco Murray or LaShawn McCoy. Those are like two very recent examples. You wouldn't expect them to fall off as big of a cliff as they did because of how efficient they were the year prior. Maybe it happens to Mark Ingram this year. He starts off hot, he faces those tough defenses, and he's just not the same back that he was last season. So 
I'm completely with you on Mark Ingram. He's not somebody I was buying because at his price, I just don't see him being a full season long starter for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a pretty risky proposition. I mean, this is someone that has never had more than 300 touches in his entire career. And it's, it's not something that you would expect to see starting at the ripe, ripe age of 30 years old. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the schedule, but also like, I think honestly, even in those early games where it's super, where it's like super easy to run schedule, um, maybe not against uh, Kansas city, but against like Cleveland, maybe not against Houston, against Washington, Cincinnati, like if Baltimore is blowing them out, I, I have a feeling that they're going to start giving Dobbins a rock to see what they have in the rookie because there's just no That's need true. to run a 30-year-old into the ground, right? So I think the leash might be even shorter because if you, if, you know, if you give J.K. Dobbins a couple snaps kind of like they did with Chubb, with what Cleveland did with Chubb in the early years, and he's, like, very explosive and, you know, he gives them a different different dynamic to the game, like, you, you can kind of see, you know, Dobbins definitely eating into his touches even a little bit earlier than, than the yeah. dust, dust late. I mean, I don't think it's ever going to be too early in the season for Dobbins to start getting his touches. And I mean, we've heard nothing but really, really, really good shit out of out of training camp for Dobbins. And he's gonna have a he's gonna have a role to start with, man. And any role is gonna be enough to you know move Ingram down the the peg a little bit because he wasn't getting volume to start with last year. It was like 14 carries a game. So yeah. Um, next up, kind of the opposite of Daniel Jones. I put this guy on here, and he's someone that's been growing on me a little bit. And it's uh, it's Jimmy GQ, uh, boy model. He is currently going as the 185 overall pick as a QB 22 and literally the opposite of Daniel Jones. He opens up with a juicy fucking slate, man. He's got Arizona. I've already got him locked in in all of my DK lineups. That's, that's truck 5,800 bucks. He's got New York jets. Then the New York giants. He gets to spank both cities uh, or sorry, both teams in the same city back to back. And then you got Philly and Miami. So, the rest of the schedules, honestly, it's pretty cake too, right? Because, I mean, the only tough matchup he has is maybe the, maybe the Saints uh, and maybe the Bills. But, like, other than that, like, even into the playoffs, it's like Washington, Dallas, Arizona. So, but we don't want to project that far ahead, mainly because, like, nobody's no fucking idea how good defenses will be like, going into the season. Like, we're just infamously bad at projecting that type of stuff. So, but just looking at the top, top five games, like, if you didn't draft a quarterback, this is, like, this is probably your go-to target for streaming. And you can get them for free in single QB leagues. And I, I bet you can get them for pretty cheap in super flex leagues as well because, you know, people just kind of build out that narrative of him missing the deep pass in the, in the Super Bowl and just, like, take big dumps on him. But at the end of the day, like, we care about scoring fantasy points. And you can, you can probably chalk Jimmy G up for at least 300 yards or at least a couple of TDs in, in all these games. I have such a hard time <clears throat> throwing Jimmy G in my lineup without <laughs> knowing what Ayuk or Debo Samuel's status is. Like, they're so both up in the air, and I feel like – one of them will be there for week one, but play on like 30% of the snaps. And the next week he'll play like 50 and the other one will play 20. I just like, I, what is, I guess like George Kittle can pop off like 275. Dante Pettis will right. be there too. So he should be all right. Yeah, he's wide receiver one. He's a, he's, he's, he's a fixture of, of Roto, <laughs> Roto exposed. <laughs> Go. Um, yeah. I'm I mean, but they got, also got like, jetpack. Who worries me looking at what he did last year. It was like the most fraudulent 27 touchdown season I've ever seen. <laughs> he had nine games with one or fewer pa uh, passing touchdowns every single game in the playoffs Nick, in the Nick Super Bowl. Would like to have a word. Jared, Nick, they're basically one of the same just California yeah. boys. What's different. You should uh, make a fucking meme with the, uh, the what's different meme. Nick Foles. Turn around and time's real tough on this one. I don't know about that, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. He's just real. He's nerve-wracking to start because even in these really easy games, you just don't know what you're going to get out of him because this just seems to be an offense that relies on their defense and then runs the ball a ton with the three-headed monster of, like, Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon, and Raheem Mostert, which, like, none of them are monsters in their own right. But I just worry about him because even though they do start off this season with an easy slate of games, as Nick was saying, like, you don't really know who's going to be 100% when they're playing. And all they really have at this point that we know is going to be a fixture of this passing game is George Kittle. And I'm not sure that he's – He's obviously a very good tight end, but I'm not sure he's enough for me to feel confident in starting Jimmy G uh, week in and week out in the first four weeks of the season. I mean, I'll tell you what he, what you got about from weapons. Yeah. from Arizona uh, last 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 year when he played them. He put you up 300 yards, four TDs in the first game, 420 yards, four TDs, and two interceptions in the second game. So, I mean, I think I think it's a pretty pretty easy play at least for the week one. If you don't feel comfortable after that, like you know, just stream quarterbacks or there's plenty of matchups you can play. But I think in that matchup in particular, it's a, it's like a, it's a pretty low, low risk and, you know, high reward proposition, especially on, uh, especially on DFS. But like, I agree, like you can't really allow him like for a season long, 
Uh, I mean, you can't really rely on any quarterback. That's just a pure pocket quarterback. Now that we have so many other like rushing quarterbacks in the league. And that's like something that often gets lost. It's like, you know, it's not just that they don't run. It's just that like, relatively speaking, if you need you want to score like a good quarterback, you have to compete against other, so many other quarterbacks that do have rushing floor. And that's why it makes some of these pocket passers a lot less valuable. But I think week one is honestly, that's a pretty safe bet. Are we going to move on to my boy? Yeah, yeah, de- definitely moving on to your boy. Uh, cool. Your favorite player of all time, the guy that you've hung up in your bedroom, I'm sure that you fall asleep <laughs> to every single night wishing that you had the locks that he has. And it's Melvin Gordon. Yeah, we know you've, you've been trying to grow the hair out to have his, but it don't <laughs> work that way. Herbert no, this sorry. time, I'll take it. <laughs> Melvin Gordon currently going as the 41st pick as the RB20. <sighs> I mean, I just he's he's in that range of running backs where I just don't go for him. But I mean, Noah, why don't you try and sell us on why you think why you think he's going to be good this year? Well, for me, he's a buy candidate, and he's somebody I liked at his price. But if you didn't draft him, I think he's somebody that presents a good enough opportunity to buy in on him because there are just so many moving parts in this offense that I wouldn't be like surprised, regardless of matchup, if they struggle coming out the gate. Because Drew Lock, I know people don't like us saying that quarterbacks stink and NFL players stink, but that guy sucks. Uh, they have a bunch of new wide receivers. They bring in Pat Shermer. They just have like a completely new offense. He's new to the team. Philip Lindsay is a good running back. And on top of that, for the first get five games of the season, come against defenses that were bottom 10 in points allowed to running backs last season. They played the New England Patriots, who were very good. They obviously lose a few guys to COVID and holding out this season, but they're still a very good defense. Tampa Bay allowed the 31st most fancy points to the running back position. Pittsburgh 27th and the Jets 24th. So, I think that he's somebody that might struggle out the gate. And maybe if he struggles and Philip Lindsay looks decent, he breaks away a few big runs, then maybe people are afraid that they spent too high of draft capital on a guy like Melvin Gordon, maybe try to sell him. And I think that's a spot where you can capitalize because I just think that what he brings to the table is a skill set that garners valuable fantasy touches, whether it's in the receiving game or on the goal line. I mean, Royce Freeman had 50 targets on this team last season. Melvin Gordon is going to walk into a role that sees at least that. I wouldn't be surprised if he challenges like 65 to 70 targets because he is a better pass catcher, a better receiver than what Philip Lindsay is. Philip Lindsay is decent on the goal line, but all he's ever had to compete with is like Devontae Booker, uh, I guess like Brandon Allen, whatever big ass quarterback that they had back there and Royce Freeman. Melvin Gordon is better than all those guys. I don't see a reason for him to not be the goal line back there. And on top of that, they still do have a very good offensive line. They were 11th in adjusted line yards last year. They're bringing Graham Glasgow. So I think although he may struggle early on in the season, as he starts to get accustomed to this offense, he's going to progress throughout the season, kind of like what he did last year. After his holdout, he kind of struggled early on, and then he started to pick it up as the season went on. I think, uh, I think we might see like a completely different Denver Broncos team than we – are expecting going into the year like we had bring we had brought this point up a few times throughout the offseason about how you know they're gearing up to try to make a run against Kansas City so they bring in all these offensive weapons maybe they go a little bit more up tempo now you know we heard about Von Miller and he's probably going to be out for the year and Bradley Chubb is going to be at far less than 100 uh, percent Chris Harris is not there anymore like this defense just might not be any good right I mean they're a Denver team so you kind of just assume that they're going to be at least like a an average defense but if this defense just is, you know, is no good, this offense is going to have to play at a much higher pace. They're going to have to run a lot more plays. They're going to have to score the ball a lot more. And it's a very different uh, point of view than we've seen Denver kind of take from an offensive standpoint over the last like five or so years. We've been so accustomed to just thinking of Denver and like cold football, hard nosed football, shit like that. And this could be an up-tempo team. And that would be really, really good for both Melvin Gordon and Philip Lindsay. Like, both of them could be good at football. Both of them could put up fantasy points. And, you know, we, we've... I think we're going to see something weird. I think we're going to see Philip Lindsay like take on uh, the grinder role in a sense. I almost think Philip Lindsay is going to get like eight to 10 carries a game in between the twenties in the red zone. They're going to put Gordon in, in the passing work, they're going to put Gordon in and uh, that's going to be super valuable. And I think, I think if you didn't grab Gordon, that was probably best for your team because if, if they do flame out, if Drew Locke does end up fucking stinking, then like you could just stay hands off. But if the team overall is like functioning well enough that you're projecting them to be good in the second half, um, then that's good because the schedule is going to be tough in the beginning and you can kind of get a feel for whether or not you expect them to get better. If they look like a complete shit show, then stay away. If they look like they're just struggling because it's a really good schedule that they're going against, then that's, that's a time to buy in on Melvin Gordon. You get to see the snap percentages. You get to see the usage of it. And you get to see whether or not they're going you know, up-tempo. Regardless of the defense, you'll be able to see the pace of the offensive uh, system. Yeah, I mean, didn't Von Miller's out, right, for the for the rest of the season? I don't know if they got yeah. a – was it, it a – It's confirmed. It was an ankle injury and he's done. 
Yeah, it's season-ending tendon injury, and then I think like Bradley Chubb is on a like his ACL something with his ACL season. Like yeah, he had the season-ending injury last year, so he's going to be less than 100. Yeah, so, so I mean, I agree with you. Like, I think I mean I don't think this defense will be nearly as good as, as people think it think it is, and um, they're probably going to get in some shootouts. Uh, like, dude, I've just been. It's not that I'm like targeting Philip Lindsay, but like I've just been getting him on a ton of my best ball teams, just like based on where he's going, um, because. Is this crazy to think that he's like the better runner than than Melvin Gordon? Not at all. Yeah, I mean, I think he, I think he is the better runner. I, I, I said this like last week. I think on one of my shows, like I think we're going to see a similar situation between him and Devin Singletary. I think both of them are going to be the undersized like grinders in their offense. It's really mm-hmm. weird, but I think that's what's going to end up happening because they're better like in between the tackle runners and the guys above them. But the other guys are bigger, better in the red zone, better at catching the ball. So I think that's what we see out of Lindsey. I, I don't know what that equates to in terms of fantasy points, but I just don't think it's going to be that big of a negative to the guys that are above them, like the, the Melvin Gordons and the Zach Mosses. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. But the weird thing is, like, I remember, like, Philip Lindsay was, like, a pretty good receiver in college, right? Or not, like, pretty good. His, but, like, his target share like, was massive, yeah. Yeah, like, t- massive target volume. He's just been, like, taking an absolute dump once he got the NFL. So I'm not sure what's bad, going on yeah. there. He's um, been bad in the passing game. But yeah, we know we know they brought Melvin Gordon in for the receiving work, and like chances are he's in the other goal line work. So I agree with you. No, he's going to have a lot of the uh, the that super valuable touches. And throughout the first part of the season, you're going to be able to see if this team is like the real deal or not. So if it's a real deal, when that schedule opens up, you you want the guys to get the targets, you want the guys to get the goal line carries. So I could see that being a, being a viable trade target for sure. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I have too many of them on my team, but I can I can really I can understand like where that path comes from. Yes, sir. All right, real quick, we are going to take a commercial break. Insert that shit, Noah. All right, all right, all right, all right. We've been talking about monkey knife fights for the entirety of the summer because they sponsored our draft guide. They're the reason that y'all have been able to get it on the cheap, on the low, low, low. But guess what? If you use monkey knife fight to get the draft guide, that means you actually put money onto their platform. It is time to use it. It is time to double it. It is time to triple it. It is time to quadruple it. It is time to Bring home the mortgage with the money that you put onto monkeyknifefight.com. It's real money. You have it. You use my promo code to get 100% deposit match bonus on it. Monkey Knife Fight is literally the funnest games, the player prop games to play on their interwebs right now. They are very different than the other sites. It's not just like over under on rushing yards. They have fantasy points included. They have a lot of fun shits to mess around with. So head over to monkeyknifefight.com and I'm going to pick a few of these games each week that are my favorites. Y'all could fade them. You can push them, whatever you want to do. But I am here to give y'all some value through Monkey Knife Fight. And tomorrow is the first kickoff of the NFL season. So that is the most exciting game that we're going to have on in a while, I have a feeling. Because it is Houston Texans traveling to Arrowhead to, to face on the Super Bowl champs. They face Kansas City Chiefs. Kansas City Chiefs whooped the shit out of the Houston Texans in the divisional playoff round last year. 51-31, to 31, if I remember correctly. And I do remember correctly because I literally just looked at it like two seconds ago. So it wasn't even really from my memory. So what you're going to do is go to monkeyknifefight.com. When you deposit 10 bucks to play with on there, you're going to use the promo code BDGE. And they're going to give you a 100% deposit match bonus. Okay? And that's up to $50. So once you're there, you click New Game. And it will bring you over to the homepage. Now, if you're playing with other sports, that's fine. But we're going to go football, obviously, because playing other sports is like speaking another fucking language for me. So they have a lot of different slates. You can look at any of the games you want and mess around with. If you if you think you have a matchup that you could take advantage of, go do so. Like Philly and Washington. Go slam Deshaun Jackson and Terry McLaurin, both going for fucking 200 burgers. But we're going to go with Houston and Kansas City because they're playing tomorrow night. And I am excited about this. I'm excited about this. For a lot of reasons. So they have different categories that you could choose from on the top here. As long as you just scroll the games, you can choose touchdown dance, which you're choosing three players to score over two and a half touchdowns, over three and a half touchdowns, over four and a half touchdowns. And depending on obviously the higher the number of touchdowns you want to pick, the more money you're going to make. And it shows you the multiplier on it. So if we want to do the 2x, if you bet $10, you'll win $20 getting it. But my favorite pick... I'm going to give one pick. I want to make this short and sweet. My favorite pick for this is right here. The more or less on top, fantasy points, Travis Kelsey and Will Fuller. This is full PPR. You can go over the little eye right here, and it will pop up with the settings on Monkey Knife Fight. All of their gameplays are full PPR. We have Will Fuller going over 14.5. We have Travis Kelsey over 18.5. This is the way I'm thinking about it. 
We have Brandon Cooks banged up. Brandon Cooks got this thigh injury, this quad injury. And he's missed a lot of time. He just missed yesterday's practice. Now, you're watching this on Wednesday. I'm filming it on Tuesday. So maybe he returned to a limited practice on Wednesday. Either way, I think that means he's going to miss the game or he's going to be limited throughout the game. Not good news to have one day of rest ready to go for Thursday night football, which means Fuller is going to be the focal point of this passing attack. 14 and a half, I think, is fucking easy money. Light work. I think he's in for eight to ten targets. He's probably going to haul in anywhere between seven and eight catches. 80 yards, probably gets into the end zone. I think he easily goes over the 14 and a half mark. And I think you should get the bet in now because as soon as Brandon Cooks gets ruled out or they or they're starting reports coming out that he's limited and whatnot, they might move around the number on Monkey Knife Fight. It might go up to 15 and a half. It might go up to 16 and a half. I don't even know if there's a number that can be high enough for Will Fuller in this week one game. So we're going to go Will Fuller. They're going to play catch up. They're going to have to throw the ball a shit ton, which is going to equate to passing yards and receiving yards receiving touchdowns and receptions for Will Fuller so I think that's easy on the other side of the equation we have Travis Kelsey going over 18 and a half might sound like a lot here's my thinking on this one one Houston Texans past events is just fucking miserable so that's that's first and foremost two as I said we've seen this matchup before look at the playoffs last year 51 to 31 what did Kelsey do in that game 12 targets, 10 receptions, 134 receiving yards, three touchdowns. They had no answer for this man, and they will have no answer for him on Thursday night football. I also think if you remember back to the Super Bowl, yes, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, but Patty Mahomes was nervous as shit when he stepped on the field. He had real Super Bowl ner- Super Bowl nerves. I don't remember if you, I don't know if you guys remember that first the first drive, first two drives, he was all over the place, extremely erratic. I think This game coming up, I mean, it's not the Super Bowl, but it fucking might as well be for America right now because we are fiending for some football and all eyes in this country and probably the entire world are going to be looking at Patty Mahomes. I think he's going to be a little nervous at the gate. You know what that's going to do? That's going to mean targets towards Kelsey. Who is his most reliable? He's not going to be throwing the ball deep when you have nerves like that. He's not going to be handing it to his rookie running back. What is the easiest way to calm down Patrick Mahomes? Kelsey. Kelsey, dart, seed, dart, seed, dart, seed to Kelsey. That's my thinking. And even if that's not true and Patrick Mahomes comes out slinging, guess what? Kelsey's catching fucking balls. Three touchdowns against Houston. Divisional playoff round, 134 yards. I think this is the easy smash. So this is what I'd be taking. I go more. I go more. We're throwing 10 bucks, 2 bucks, 5 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever it is. You throw down 10, you're going to win 25 for hitting the over on both of those guys. So you have 35 in the pocket. You can bet 20 if you want because when you deposit $10 on monkeyknifefight.com, and you use promo code BDGE, they are going to hit you with a 100% deposit match bonus. That's up to $50. And again, they got like 100 different game types on here that you can mess around with, and you can hit any slate. You could hit KC Houston. You can get hit fucking Green Bay, Minnesota, New York Jets, Buffalo. I don't know why anyone would stick their hands into that pot, but you could do what you want. This is a free country. This is America. They also have Canada. They're open in Canada. If you need to know whether or not you're eligible to play, just hit the little FAQ over here on the bottom left, and it's got all the states that they are eligible in they just opened up in new jersey and in new york and like six other states so go check that shit out promo code bdge when you deposit some money and good luck let's pay the mortgage baby we're bike no let's talk some chargers let's talk some chargers we, we don't have fuel. to i promise we don't have to talk about the chargers <laughs> you're the one you didn't you put him on this list uh, yes i did <laughs> yes yeah exactly so we're going to talk about your chargers so we had a former charger melvin gordon who's a buy but anyone who's actually on the chargers now we're probably going to want to sell for that reason we have hunter henry of keenan allen when you look at the chargers schedule up front i i, I don't think we want to sell them right out of the gate but you're going to want to sell them for the second half of the year because they start with cincinnati kansas city carolina tampa bay new orleans new york jets miami jacksonville las vegas so it's like seven really, really friendly passing defenses. Uh, two of them are obviously tough, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, uh, New Orleans, I guess, too. But they're all going to have to throw and catch up and, and put the ball in the air. So obviously good for Hunter Henry, obviously good for Keenan Allen. We have Mike Williams, who's going to be sidelined. Is, is, what, what's the uh, like final decision? He's going to be out for the first couple for weeks. week one, but I've also seen that he might miss the first month of the season. He's always hurt, though, so I wouldn't expect him to play. Latest probably... is game time decision for week one. Yeah, he'll probably be – like back on the field for 70% of the snaps by maybe like week three or something like that. But the second half of the year is when things kind of flip around, right? They have their buy after that really easy slate of games in the beginning. And then you're at Denver at Buffalo, new England, and then they're Denver again, 
uh, in week 16. But again, we did talk about how, you know, Chris Harris is not there and their defense won't be as like tantalizing as it's been the last couple of years. My thinking though, is over the second half of the year, like two things can happen. The reason I would want to sell Keenan Allen like high after like a really big first month is it's only a matter of time before Herbert gets on the field, man. If they're not winning games or if they're not letting Tyrod fucking sling it for the entire of the year, which I'd put my money on that not happening, not only does the schedule get hard over the second half, but you could probably project a quarterback change, and that's not going to be good for anyone except for opposing. You mean a tight end change? Defenses. You mean a tight end change? Yeah, that's why we're selling Hunter Henry. They can't have two tight ends on the field at the same time. <laughs> They're not throwing the ball. We're not throwing We're the ball. We're going to go with the first ever 13, actually 14 personnel. Three <laughs> tight ends in the goal line and then one in the backfield. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think I think the second half schedule is tough. I think that there's likely going to be a quarterback change, and it's going to be really, really nice in the beginning of the year. So it kind of sets up for a, a perfect sell high for this passing offense. Yeah, I agree with you there. The thing about Hunter Henry, why I'd want to sell him after the early slate of games is because – Obviously, imagine, imagine drafting Hunter Henry, though. Yeah, I would. I would never. It's kind of crazy, though, that we're trying to sell guys in a team that's going to be like nine and zero at that point. So uh, I, have, I have no clue where we're at. But Hunter Henry, I'd want to sell because you can only go down from there, bro. You're going to have a really I can't wait for you to go nine and zero and then not make the playoffs. <laughs> I'd rather much go like oh and nine. Uh, Mike Williams gonna be out for like four, four weeks, probably more than that, because every time this guy catches a ball more than 20 yards down the field, he's grabbing his back and he's sitting on the sideline. But he's been a huge part of this red zone offense. Last year, he only had, I think, two touchdowns. The year before, he had 10. But he's seen 28 red zone targets and 16 inside the 10 targets over the past two years. We know that this is not going to be a high-volume type of passing offense just because they do have Tyrod Taylor. They may have to play Justin Herbert out there. And the fact that they have Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen, very easy completions because they just stay at and around the line of scrimmage. Hunter Henry looks to be the third target in this offense. With Mike Williams out, at least he'll have red zone upside and end zone upside. So when you're looking for a tight end, you want either like a lot of volume or a lot of valuable volume. And I think they'll have somewhat of both to start off the season. But as Mike Williams starts to come in, he is a pretty good receiver. So he's going to command some volume. The overall volume is going to go down. The valuable volume is going to go down. If he is producing early on, I'd rather just move him for like a good flex player and then try to scream off the waiver wire or move him for a tight end that maybe has a good second half of the year schedule and try to ship him off because – the impending doom of Justin Herbert taking over is going to happen. So uh, I'm a big fan of selling Hunter Henry because he's also probably going to get hurt in the second half of the season. Keenan Allen, man, I have him in zero leagues. I wish I did. Not so I could sell him, so I could hold on to him. So that's some guy. That's one guy I'm going to disagree on because he's probably going to have like 180 targets this year, catch like 150 of them for like 900 yards and three touchdowns. You have to throw the ball 180 times <laughs> to have 180 targets, though. All right, Mike, what are your thoughts? Uh, I agree on Hunter Henry. I don't know if I'm selling Keenan Allen. I think, you know, he's going super cheap in drafts and I'm actually targeting him in in redraft leagues. And, you know, look at the second part of the schedule. Like the bills are tough. um, And, you know, the Patriots are tough, assuming Gilmore travels into the slot, which he usually does. Um, But after that, I mean, for the fantasy playoffs, you get the Falcons at home, you get the Raiders uh, at the Raiders, but still the Raiders. And then, you know, you get the Broncos at home. We kind of talked a little bit about the Broncos schedule. So, I don't know if I'm going to sell how and get now. I'm going to see how it goes, but I, I guess I definitely get the concern with Justin Herbert because I mean, him coming in is going to be bad for the offense as a whole, but that's at it, the end of the day. If, if you roll, I, if you, if you roll the dice and they make that quarterback switch, like Allen just drops down to the next tier of wide receivers. I, I think at the end of the day though, I mean, like who's going to be a friendlier target than Allen and Eckler. I mean, he's just, I don't, I think I don't want friendly targets. Way. I want fantasy points. He's Fuck just going to, he's just, he's just going to throw to them a bunch. Uh, so maybe. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that worried about Keenan Allen, but I am definitely concerned about Hunter Henry once, like, Williams comes back and then, you know, Justin Herbert coming in. It all, it all depends, right? Like, look, if, if Keenan Allen goes on that, like, quintessential Keenan Allen tear where he's, like, 13 targets, 11 catches, 100 yards, like, 10, 10 targets, 8 catches, like, 90 yards and touchdown, like, during his heydays, and you can get, like, you know, someone back for him that's, like, relevant, like, equivalent in value, then, yeah, I'm all, I'm all for – pumping out on that on that risk and just going with someone else you know maybe you can add a little bit and get like a julio or something down the line i would be down for that but like if he's still kind of like getting disrespected which he typically always does then i'm also kind of fine holding him and playing him as like my wide receiver two three which is sometimes where you can draft him i feel like you 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 personally feel disrespected when keenan allen gets disrespected i I do why why do we disrespect him he's both of you get so upset when Keenan so, Allen gets disrespected. He's so fucking good. 
<laughs> you know who's pretty fucking good too? Jonathan Taylor. I'm assuming you you put uh, him on. You know what the problem with Jonathan Taylor is though? Like you you're not gonna be able to buy him anywhere. Like <laughs> yeah, those, those who drafted him are not giving him up for anything. The thing is, like people did the same thing with Miles Sanders last year, and like eight weeks into the year, people were selling him because they got real fed up with him. I mean, he's still going like no, that no one was as high on on they weren't as high on Miles Sanders as they were JT. Like you have to get JT in the third round or you're not getting him this year. Sanders is like a six seventh round. Dude, I got right. him. I got him. That's why I love work leagues. I got him at the at the back end of the fourth when I was picking from the 102 and uh, someone picked, someone picked like, I think Todd Gurley, like right before, right before him. And I was like, fucking Christ. fuck yes. <laughs> They're going to have a nice first four weeks and you're going to have a nice last 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah. It, it, this is, this will be a tough buy. We're going to see what happens. But if we think back to, you know, who is he most often compared to? And it's Nick Chubb, right? If we think back to Nick Chubb in his rookie season with Carlos Hyde there and, you know, Marlon Mack is a, is a better Carlos Hyde, I would say. Um, yeah. like Nick Chubb, like he was getting, like he was getting explosive plays, right? Like there was a game where he had three touches, 120 yards and like two touchdowns. That was insane. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like he took like two, two, two carries to the house. I could totally see that happening with Jonathan Taylor, but you cannot start based on that type of volume. The problem is he gets to start with Jacksonville. So I think this game is going to be a critical tell all of what the temperature gauge is going to be on Jonathan Taylor, because if he gets like 12, the 15 touches against Jacksonville and he rips one, you can kiss trying to buy him goodbye. Right? He's got but, it. They're going to control that game. Like there's no way Jacksonville is going to be able to compete with Indy. Like it, it might be slow paced and maybe they'll be within like, you know, a touchdown or 10 points, but realistically they're not really going to be in the game. And I think that does dictate. Yeah. JT is going to bust one, bro. He's going to yeah. bust seven yard touchdown week one and then it's fucking over. <laughs> Wait, it's over. Well, well, here's what you're praying you're for. Busting here's one. Your praying for. is playing quarterback for the Indianapolis <laughs> <laughs> here's what you're praying for you're praying for jt getting a decent amount of snaps but not breaking a touchdown that's what you want yeah, you want him to get like you know get get a decent amount of snaps but like a very pedestrian 50 to 60 yards no td marlon mack gets the goal line work week one that's exactly what you want to see because that that's going to tell you that one they got him involved early so you know it's coming and that if you get jt enough touches he will break one that is a virtual fucking lock behind that goal line behind that offensive line so this, that's what you want, right? If that another, happens, another, I'm all in. Yeah, another strategy uh, kind of tip right there that, that Mike touched on, like understanding snap counts is super, super important in the beginning of the year. And we've talked about this website before, but lineups.com has free snap counts. And I mean, honestly, it's 2020, so you just go on Google and type in like snap counts, and I'm sure 72 websites will pop up for it. So like, here's the thing. it's There's the difference between, okay, so like two similar players, like off the top of my head, like two similar players, you have both sub 4440s, both like good downfield playmakers, both have made plays in the NFL, right? Both had big week ones, week twos last year. One of them was like a 95% player. One of them was like a 65, 70% snap guy. What's more predictive of continuing to have success down the line of that season? Who do you pick up? One person picks up Chris Conley. The other person picks up Terry McLaurin. Yeah. Like you need to understand the play time in the beginning of the year because – when you see Terry McLaurin pop off, you might be like, oh, he's kind of like a one-hit wonder. He just caught like one deep ball. But when you look a little bit deeper into it, you see that he played on 95% of the fucking snaps. So he's going to continue to see a lot of targets. So it's very important, especially with like running back by committees like this. You want to see if JT, did he play like low-key like 60% of the snaps and Marlon Mack is only 40, but maybe Mack had a couple more carries. You know, those are the kind of things you need to look for in the beginning because if you miss out on them in weeks one, week two, that's when most of the good waiver wire pickups get kind of sucked up or that's when the smart players the sharp players start setting the trade targets because they're also looking at those things yeah especially for running back like you just got to be on the field right if, and if you're someone as talented as jonathan taylor if you're on the field eventually you will you will like bust one and that's just going to happen and the one thing i will say is <coughs> the other thing i do pay attention to is snaps uh by quarter because you know what you can see by that is like for example last year when Baltimore was blowing the fuck out of the where do you Dolphin, where do you see that what uh what's that um there was a it's called like a fantasy data so I got I got to look I have a bunch I of no like, Pro Football Reference does splits by quarter but it's not snaps so you can like see touches by quarter but not the snap yeah quarter. I remember I forgot where it was I have like a bunch of freaking bookmarks I have to go back and look at my redraft stuff Bro. but yeah that's something I looked at for like uh, Marquise Brown for example you know like after like the first half they basically just benched him because his because his foot was hurting and then the other thing is the one thing that snaps doesn't really apply to as well is uh is tight ends because tight ends are in their blocking half the time so you don't want to like 
be like, oh shit, this guy's got like a ninety percent snap share, but you know he's blocking. Like you're not you're gonna miss on guys like Mark Andrews by looking at it like that. You want to see like which which guys are running routes and you know how often they're running routes down the field. So that's the one the one caveat I'll say about snaps is like it really works well for wide receivers and for running backs, but for tight ends you want to look at the routes run. Yeah, you want to you want the best the best site for that stuff would be playerprofiler.com. You could see route participation, you could see hog rate, which is like the percentage of, you know, your target share while on the field. And then if you actually go over to the game log, uh the game log section, not the metrics, it's the next one over, you could look at snap share uh and routes run and things like that. So it's a lot more broken down for tight ends and I agree with that because tight ends are so it's such a tricky position to scope out for fantasy. You can't look at the raw numbers because every team decides how they want to use their personnel when it comes to tight end so differently like the chargers want to use their uh tight end at quarterback okay Wild. that's i think it's time <laughs> to move on i don't even know what we're talking about anymore who do you have preston <laughs> williams left man fuck this guy yeah so okay I'll, I'll, i want to talk about preston williams because preston williams is a guy typically if a guy's coming off an acl like a very serious injury like that he's basically just going to be off my board like if i can pick between one or two guys and like one guy's coming off the acl i'm just not going to end up uh, looking for a guy like that, like Preston Williams. And Preston Williams, admittedly, was not a guy I watched a lot of last year. I mean, he had the huge preseason. He had the great first half of the year, you know, coming out of a, a very late round pick and kind of just working his way into the lineup, making the 53, starting to make plays in the NFL. So I went back and I watched uh, the games that he played in and the balls that were thrown his way. And, like, this dude is, like, very, very, very good. And he left a lot of points on the field, too. Like, he had a, a few concentration drops, like, very far down the field that would have, you know, he would have fucking put Devontae Parker's fantasy points in the dirt had he came in with a few of those. So I'm looking at Preston. I'm like, he's, you know, he is against my rule where I don't necessarily draft guys who are coming off the ACL tear. I want them two years removed. But we made the mistake with Cooper Cup last year. And now I'm like, okay, maybe if they're a younger player and we follow reports really closely, everything out of camp for Miami is saying that he looks really, really good. And then uh, Brett Coleman, I don't know if you guys are familiar with his work on YouTube. He like DM me randomly like two weeks ago out of nowhere and just like, yo, Preston Williams. He's like, I got, I got the hookups in Miami. He's like, I got people that are at his practices and they're like, he is 100% good to go. And when Brett speaks, I listen to that shit and they have him returning kicks and returning punts. I'm like, that's dumb as fuck because that's how he ended up tearing the ACL in the first place. But if they're comfortable enough doing that, he's probably ready to go. And like everything we're hearing is that Preston looks as good, if not better. So what I think is, is the beginning of their schedule. I don't actually have it up right now. I think one of you guys had something listed with Miami or maybe I read it somewhere, but Miami's beginning of the season schedule uh, is very tough. So they're going to start out of the gate, probably a little bit slow. I think the second half of the year is when we see a uh, semi like Preston breakout because he'll be a full year removed from the ACL and I do think there's a really really high likelihood that by the second half of the year we see Tua get in the game and I'm not going to sit here and be like I'd rather have Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing Preston Williams the ball than than Tua so I think uh one year removed from the ACL uh an easier schedule of the second half of the year and then Tua behind center and just like everything we've heard about Preston so far this summer is just like okay maybe he is back maybe he's just really fucking good at football yeah, first eight weeks of the season, he plays the Patriots, the Bills, the Seahawks, the 49ers, the Broncos, the Chargers, the Rams. And then I left out one team. They play the Jaguars, so that should be decent. But then the second half of the year, he plays the Cardinals, the Jets. The Jets, again, they play them back-to-back. The Bengals. Like the the Jets by Jets, right? Yeah. The, the, what was it? the Bengals, the Chiefs, the Patriots is tough, and then the Raiders. So basically, he has seven really tough matchups in the first half of the season, seven easy ones in the second half. And as you were saying, he carved out a huge role in, in his rookie year, despite being an undrafted free agent. And he was catching passes from Josh Rose in a few games. So he, he looked really good, as you said, like you went back and watched him. I remember watching a few of his catches and a few of his touchdowns last season. He reminds me a little bit, like this isn't uh, high praise, but like also Auden Tate kind of reminded me of him, like just a big lanky receiver that can catch jump balls and uh, adjust the balls in midair. And I know that Devontae Parker is still a very good receiver and he's probably going to be the number one in this offense. But if you're buying – Preston Williams, you're not buying him at anywhere near the price of Devontae Parker. We know that Mike Gesicki is not good at football, so Preston Williams is going to be the number two in this offense. They upgraded their defense a little bit, but I don't think that's going to change their team going from a complete garbage time offense to a revamped type of defense that helps their offense and they can control the clock. I still think they're going to be throwing a ton, and maybe he does develop chemistry with Tua Tagovailoa, but we do know the Ryan Fitzpatrick will just throw to anybody that's over six foot two. And Preston Williams fits that mold to a T. So if he's healthy in the second half of the season with that schedule, he looks to be a very good like flex type of consideration player. Yeah, he's he's definitely an interesting, interesting player. And if we if you think back to 
uh, what he was as a as a prospect. Um, this guy put up an absolute fucking monster season uh, at Colorado State, right? And the reason why he fell in the draft was for a lot of other reasons. I think he had some trouble with like probably domestic violence uh, with his girlfriend and stuff like that, so he went undrafted. But talent was not not really an issue, and we kind of saw a lot of that come through. And the other thing to remember is even though it was a tough schedule, like it's the Patriots, for example, right? Like Stephon Gilmore is going to be shadowing Devontae Parker because that's how team view the Dolphins as the true true one on that offense. So when that happens, like he's probably still going to get some pretty favorable matchups, even in some of those tough matchups. Uh, like you, I'm not going to be too, uh, like too all in uh, early on the season because the dude did fucking tear his ACL. And as, as optimistic as, you know, Brett Sounds and the team is, I'm still going to approach it. A little bit more cautiously but yeah after that i think it's it's wheels up you know I, i'm i'm a big fan of parker as well um but i think just both parker and preston williams are pretty good bets at the cost because gasicki fucking stinks uh so people are propping up his his adp it's just um, it's gonna be yeah like a really high volume passing offense that's a, just a strict funnel to these two guys i think williams and parker probably eat up the majority of the work there and uh even if even if it's like a slight edge towards Parker, I think Williams will have more than enough more than enough to work with because he's a guy who can make plays after the catch, like super strong hands, especially in the red zone, and uh, we've seen him targeted down there a bunch. So I, I I'm I'm really like in on a, a a monster second half for Preston here. Yeah, the key is the red zone. Like he he yeah. did get a target like when they were both on on the field. Like he was getting the looks in the red zone, not Parker. So uh, that that is definitely something that's pretty lucrative uh, for someone that's going to his ADP and. You know, I would not be surprised if he finished in like the top 24 wide receivers. And for that type of price, it's exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for wide receiver two upside. Nobody gives a fuck about wide receiver three upside because that's just basically someone that has a healthy season. But you're looking for wide receiver two points per game upside. And I think Preston Williams <laughs> I love definitely, that. Wide definitely receiver, gives you that. Wide receiver threes are just guys who have healthy seasons. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really what it fucking comes That's basically down. what it is. If you play yeah, 16 games, season. you're a wide receiver three. That's fucking big facts right there. <laughs> um, all right. Is that, is that the last person? We no, I think, that, I think that's it. I thought the segue was in a way. Oh, yeah. It didn't really work out. He's just somebody – I think if you're watching this channel, though, you probably don't have Kerryon Johnson on your roster. But if you did happen to draft him somehow or you got auto-picked like I did, he's somebody that I'd sell just because in the end of the day, talent wins out. DeAndre Swift probably – he might not play week one. He might be – if he does, he's going to be extremely limited, uh, at least early on in the season. And the fact that Kenyon Drake gets – not Kenyon Drake. Kerryon Johnson gets to play the Green Bay Packers and the Arizona Cardinals in two of his first three weeks, maybe – he has a semblance of talent in any of those games, despite him saying like his knees don't bend the right way. And DeAndre Swift is a much better running back than him, which I'd argue like when you get a job, you should probably not say that another person competing for that job is better than you at that. But uh, I think that alone just tells you you should sell carry on Johnson because if you invested any sort of draft capital in him, knowing that DeAndre Swift was like the second rookie running back off the board. And we know that he's basically just DeAndre Swift, but worse in every aspect of the game you know that talent is eventually going to win out. And we saw last year that Daryl Bevel wasn't afraid to give one guy uh, the big line share of the workload, no pun intended. And I think DeAndre Swift fits into that workload. <laughs> he fits into that role a lot better than Karrion Johnson because we saw Karrion Johnson last year basically be the poster boy for like 17 carries, 43, uh, 43 rushing yards, like four targets, two catches, and seven yards. They do bring in Adrian Peterson as well. So maybe this doesn't mean like if you're selling Karrion Johnson by DeAndre Swift, maybe just fade this backfield as a whole because it does look pretty messy, especially with Swift being injured early on. I could maybe even see this being like a three-headed monster where each guy gets like eight to ten touches a week and you just want to stay far away from him. I wouldn't Swift be, I Swift wouldn't be surprised um, if – first of all, first of all, I just want to say like this is probably like the, the first time that I've seen a player just like willingly yield – and be like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just not as good as the other guy. Like, Karen Johnson is probably like the first guy that would trade himself in. in, in <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, he would trade himself for, for like DeAndre. He's stuff. The comment in this video is like, good pick on the last guy you guys talked about. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think, I think the, here's here's the thing. I think there, there's a chance that they trade him because they brought in AP to kind of fill in that first and second down grind and roll. And I just, I don't know why, but they just fucking hate the guy. Like, he had a good rookie season. And then last year, Patricia came in and was like, nope, you fucking stink. Like, we're not giving you any more targets, even though you're the best target. I feel like Patricia just thinks he's soft. And then yeah. he just can't <laughs> hurt. And he's like, dude, we can't do anything with you if you're just never on the field. So dude. at this point, it's like Patricia takes it fucking personally. That, that's like, that's honestly, I would not be shocked if that's what it was. And if they traded him to like Chicago Bears, something like that. Like, I could totally see him getting traded. If he gets traded, wheels, 
fucking up, up, up for DeAndre Swift because Karen Johnson is better than Adrian Peterson uh, by every metric. So that's something to monitor, to monitor. I think it's definitely a possibility. It's in the range of outcomes. So just keep that in mind uh, when it comes to Karen Johnson. I actually low-key feel like it's it has something to do with fantasy football. Like, I feel like people want Karen Johnson to be a workhorse so bad, and Patricia never wanted to do it, <laughs> and he just gets a 1,000 questions a day. Like, when is Karen going to get 20 touches a game? And he's just like, shut the fuck up. Karen can't handle 20 touches a game. And he eventually gets fucking peer pressured and bullied into doing it, and then Karen gets hurt. So now he, like, has takes that hatred out on Karen Johnson. <laughs> and here we are. They signed fucking AP's old ass. And DeAndre Swift is fucked. He's fucked. He's fucked. <laughs> As soon as they reported that he's been out for like five, six days, I was like, DeAndre Swift is fucked. Dude, your you're like, you're hit rate or whatever, your anti-hit rate on your must-own running backs this season has been phenomenal. Brutal. Just phenomenal. Fucking like, brutal. You can't miss. You cannot miss with the kiss of death this season. You can't miss. <laughs> yeah, wait, who did I talk about in this episode? I just talked about Mark Ingram. He's a goat. <laughs> That's yeah, fucking Keenan confirmed Allen. goaded I, I season. RJ on Keenan Allen. I'll take that one to the bank. <laughs> No, you won't, though, because that one's going to work. Anything Charger-related works every time. <laughs> that's not your doing, though. That's just the universe. No. All right. That's all we got for you for this week's trade targets. Man, I'm fucking tired. It's late. But hopefully – fucking exhausting. Mike, right? I, block for you. I was going to ask, Mike, like, there, you were, like, dead this entire video. Like, you are fucking – we're all dead right now. No, just we are fucking smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying. We're trying our best out here, boys, man. We're trying to get you guys video content. We still got the maximum slate of videos coming at you this coming week. Uh, you know, got five fact Fridays. And next week, again, we're going to start the new cycle. And as Nick said, we're kind of getting the season. It's going to be fucking football, guys. It's going to be football. It's going to be football. And I cannot freaking Incredible. wait. I cannot wait. I cannot wait for this opener because this might be one of the best season openers that we've had in a long time. It's Deshaun Watson versus Patrick Mahomes. How do you think this plays out? I think Mahomes – you remember how how uh, nervous Mahomes was playing in the Super Bowl? Do you remember, like, the first couple drives, how yeah. fucking bad he looked? Yeah, I feel like we're going to – yeah, I feel like this – tomorrow night is, like, low-key, like, America's Super Bowl, in a sense, I feel like. <laughs> like, we've all been waiting for this. This honestly might be more watched than the Super Bowl is, and, <laughs> and Mahomes is going to be nervous, I think. I think, we see, uh, I think we see the Chiefs come out a little bit rusty. Yeah, I think they're nine and a half point favorites. I'm going to roll with the Houston Texans, but with my pick record, I mean – Probably no, just <laughs> take them take them first half. Do Houston first half because then the Chiefs will go nuts in the second half. I mean, just like Brian, last year. Just going to run it out after that. Just like last year, man. Just like last year. But uh, Chiefs defense, if you listen to Nick and I, I hope you guys fucking roster the Chiefs defense because they are going to eat. Yes, sir. No doubt about it. All right. All right. Cool. That's all we got. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to both thy channels if you are new. And we'll see you all next week. Okay, okay, sure. <laughs> I got a lot on my mind right now. I didn't sleep well, so my brain's not working well. What's cracking, big? Hold up. Um, I'm so mad. <laughs> Dude, that's, like, that's like waking somebody up when they're in like a deep sleep or they're in like sleep paralysis or whatever the fuck it is when they're sleepwalking. Uh, what, what's so important? Uh, what's, what are we doing for the narrative? For what? For the narrative. Why are you bringing that up now? We, 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 I feel like we decide that at the end every time. <laughs> I don't know. I just decided to bring it up. Oh, actually, I got, I got one. I got one. We got it. We got it. You're good to go. What are we doing for this video? You're good to go. Yeah, what, what are we doing for this? <laughs> You're good to go. <laughs>